Welcome back to Law News Network. I'm Heather Hansen, and we are so excited to have Dr. Dominic Sportelli with us today. We've had Dr. Sportelli on with us before. He's a double board certified psychiatrist who has so many chops to be talking about some of the issues that come up in this trial and this Vegas shooter. So good afternoon, Dr. Sportelli. Good afternoon, Heather. Thanks for having me. Fabulous to have you here. I want to talk to you about the Jessica Chambers case, and we're definitely going to get into that. But first, I wanted to ask you about something that I read that I thought was really interesting. Apparently, the shooter in the Vegas case had been prescribed Valium pretty regularly. In fact, one article described it as he had a Valium doctor on retainer. There have been some research studies that made a correlation between the use of Valium and aggression, especially in men. Can you tell us a little bit about that study and what, how that may have impacted this crime? Yeah, for sure. I think, so first and foremost, we're trying to find tidbits of information about this guy, Stephen Paddock, to understand what his motive was. So any information that we have, I think, is important. When we find out that he was taking Valium, as a psychiatrist, the first thing that jumps into my mind is, okay, so he had an issue with something, whether it was anxiety, whether it was insomnia, who knows, but he was seeing somebody for a behavioral concern. That raises a red flag to me. With regard to benzodiazepines and that class in general, you have Ativan, Xanax, Valium. So these are the, sort of the, the, the main um, medicans, med medications in that class. This particular study showed, it was a Finnish study in Finland that showed 960 or so males that were convicted of murder. When they looked at these individuals, it showed that there was a 45% higher incidence of committing homicide if they were on benzodiazepines. That was one particular study. There were other studies that showed, quotes, a moderate correlation between benzodiazepines and violence and aggression. Now, as a psychiatrist, I will tell you this. I will tell you that for the most part, 99.9% .9 of the time, the benzodiazepines relax people. They help people just completely relax when you have acute anxiety, and that's what we prescribe them for. They are prescribed for other things, such as a muscle relaxer, if you have muscle spasm. They're prescribed for seizure disorders, but for the most part, to help people relax if they have anxiety. Now, in a very select population, in a very small select population, people can have what's called a paradoxical reaction to a benzodiazepine. Now that pretty much means the opposite effect. We see this mostly as doctors in the elderly and in children. We very rarely see it in healthy, young, or you know, relatively young adults. Here's the thing. If Stephen Paddock had a paradoxical reaction to a benzodiazepine, most of that reaction tends to be delirium, which means confusion, right? right? So in that case, this gentleman was not planning a homicide the way that he did this, which, which obviously, you know, there was an enormous amount of planning and coordination. If somebody was withdrawing from benzodiazepines, if someone was having a, a, a delirious reaction to benzodiazepines, they would not have been able to pull this off. Yeah, I mean, with the amount of planning that was, it, it seems to me what you're what you're saying is these types of crimes would have to be more impulsive for the moment than a well planned out, well thought out attack like this one. Correct. Now, I, listen, don't get me wrong. There are instances where people are taking benzodiazepines on a regular basis, every day, every few hours, and if you stop, quotes cold turkey you can have withdrawal phenomenon that can actually be pretty dangerous, but sometimes it can cause an increase in anxiety, irritability, aggression, just from the withdrawal. Here's the important question that remains is, was he taking it at the time of the homicides? How much was he taking? Was he taking more than prescribed? Because the doses that I read about, 10 milligrams a day, not a high dose at all, right? Was he combining it with anything else? Because of course, benzodiazepines combined with alcohol, opiates, any other medicines will change the picture dramatically. So I still have a lot of questions that are unfortunately going to be unanswered for a while. It's interesting. The medical records may be one of the biggest clues in this case where he had so little of a digital footprint and so little of information for us. One more question on this, um, and I don't know whether you, you have the answer to this, but one of the things I read is that many marksmen, many people who enjoy shooting for fun, will take Valium to make them better marksmen. Have you heard anything about that? I have. So that's the interesting point. When people have performance anxiety, when people get a sympathetic nervous system surge, when they have to perform in some way, they may take a benzodiazepine to help calm their nerves so they can be more still. This is common, unfortunately, in marksmen and people in the Olympics. That's why, that's why they test for these drugs, right? Because 
someone in the Olympics who's a marksman can't take this because it'll help them relax to the point where their hands won't shake and they will have better aim. You know, I mean, to think that potentially he took this for that reason, I, I certainly don't know. Um, it sounds like he was prescribed this way before any incident like that, and it was for anxiety. Um, so you're right, it is prescribed for performance anxiety and can settle someone's nerves if they have to do something like a certain task. Well, but uh, I don't think that's the case here. Dr. Sportelli, thank you. Those, I was so curious about that because it's such an enigma as to what happened here, so I really appreciate your insight. Now we are going to switch to the case that we're about to start any, any minute now, probably within the half hour, and that is the trial of Quentin Tellis. And we were talking a little bit about this off air. The fact that this, this involved arson, what does that signify to you as a psychiatrist? So arson is a big topic in forensic psychiatry because arson in and of itself is sort of a diagnosis, pyromania. And when pe that's, that's basically a DSM or a di Diagnostic Statistical Manual Diagnosis. People actually have difficulty with pyromania, setting fires, arson. It also, there's something called the McDonald Triad, which you may have heard, where when a child is setting fires, wetting the bed, and injuring animals, it leads towards more of a sociopathic picture in the individual. Mm -hmm. So arson is very much linked to psychiatry and behavior. <laughs> the, the thing here with this particular case is we have to question, is this arson per se? Was this arson for the desire to set fire to someone or something? Or was this after the fact? Because we have to say, listen, you know, a lot of perpetrators know that by setting fire to a body or a crime scene, you're destroying forensic evidence. So the motive is is certainly in question, right? The uh, God, I'm sorry. No, that that's right. The motive is definitely in question, and it can be a different, I guess, psychiatric <clears throat> profile if it's someone who's committing murder and then using the arson to cover that up. Yeah, and and listen, in psychiatry again. The importance when you look at arson is, unfortunately, arson has been linked to psychosis. If, if someone is committing arson, believe it or not, there's a four times higher likelihood of some sort of psychosis. Wow. This is repeated arson. What we also see in the epidemiological literature is that people that uh, engage themselves in pyromania and arson tend to have a lower intellectual capacity in a lot of cases. And there's also an association with borderline personality disorder and various personality disorders as well. So it does open up sort of a can of worms with regard to what's going on in this person's psyche. The other question I had, as I look at him, and he's, he is alleged to have committed another murder, that's the murder of Mandy Zhao um, in Louisiana, which he will apparently face trial for later. But I was wondering at violent crimes, and I guess they have to start somewhere. You know, usually we say, well, there's no history of violence, but that history has to start somewhere. If you have someone committing crimes as violent as the ones that Quentin Tellis is accused of, does that usually start in childhood, or can it begin at, at his age? Well, I'll tell you, that's a great question. And, you know, in a lot of cases, what you'll see in childhood is not necessarily antisocial personality disorder, but we see something called conduct disorder. Because the truth is, you can't give someone a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder until they're about age 18. But you do see people that follow a criminal pattern starting at a young age with conduct disorder. And these are getting, you know, minor, minor issues with the law trouble with authority, trouble with teachers, difficulty with parents, things like that. And then you'll start to see some very, not necessarily violent crime per se, but mostly just difficulty with rules, regulations, and authority. And that sort of points more towards that sociopathic personality that may be more likely to commit crime in the future. So you don't necessarily need violence, but you may see a pattern of just issues with authority. So the fact that TELUS has been convicted of crimes involving burglary, um, two different counts of those in two different years, may actually support the idea that this was sort of the road that he was headed down? Yeah, I think it paints a nice picture looking at his past for sure. Now, for him to go from this alleged crime, which involved arson, to the crime in Louisiana, which involved stabbing in a very violent way and apparently stabbing her until um, she gave him her PIN number, this, these are the allegations, and then finally having the last, um, the last stab wound, would someone who started with arson stick with arson? Is there any sort of like consistency in the level of type of violence in these types of crimes? Yeah, and that's when it comes to a psychiatric diagnosis of, of particularly an arsonist or someone that's involved in pyromania. 
people that like to set fires to various things, buildings, cars, people, animals, things like that. In his case, it was an isolated incident, but I will tell you this. What's, what's especially troubling about this is that when you look at the psychology of someone that sets fire to a living victim, there tends to be a psycho, psychological component of anger and a, a desire to punish the individual, right? So sometimes if that person can be traced to have any kind of relationship with the victim, there's usually a very tumultuous relationship and something where the, the perpetrator feels they need to get revenge, and that's why it's so violent. That's what we see with fire setting of victims. In his case, this was, this was kind of isolated, and, and again, the motive is sort of questionable. Yeah, I mean, much of that will remain to be seen with openings as to whether or not there's some motive that it was revenge for perhaps a broken heart or she chose to be with someone else or something like that. But if that is there, then that would certainly feed into what you just told us about anger and, and retribution. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a question, and I don't know whether this is something that you're able to, uh, to address. If the fire, whether or not a fire would affect someone's ability to speak. This is more of a medical doctor than a psychiatric doctor question. But I would imagine, just uh, relatively speaking, that be, having, being set on fire, and then she lived for another 20, uh, less than 24 hours, that that would certainly impact your ability to speak and to communicate. Yeah, no question about it, you know, um, and I do appreciate the medical question because psychiatrists do go to medical school. Right, but, of course, uh, <laughs> of course. So, you know, yes, absolutely. Now, not knowing her particular injuries, which I know were very, very extensive and severe, I will tell you this, I have worked on burn units in my training, and heat and fire affect your airway, which is what we use to vocalize. It can affect your vocal cords, and it can affect your lungs, all of which are needed to verbalize and speak. So no question about it, it can, and it can affect your, your ability to communicate. I have one last little area of questions that we haven't discussed before, so I'm putting you a little bit on the spot. But I'm wondering how listening to testimony like this impacts the jury. You know, I, I always think about these juries who serve in these cases, and I know for myself covering this case is the hardest case for me to have covered because it's so grisly and so terrible and so much pain. How does it impact the people who are sitting there with this life or death, life in prison in their hands and looking at this family? Do they tend to have repercussions from serving on these types of juries? Yeah, and that's, that's a great question because here's the fact, we're not robots, we're all human. And every single individual on that jury stand has different histories and different experiences. And, and I think a large part why attorneys present photographs of crime scenes is because it really drives home the message of how severe a crime is. And especially if you see something so horrific as a burn victim, which is very, very difficult to look at. And we know that, that burns are incredibly painful and just devastating. I think it can affect the jury in a very significant way. I think to the point where some people can even be traumatized by photos like this. I have to sort of skip around um, and go back to another question <clears throat> from one of our chatters. Ray is asking, you had mentioned conduct disorders in teens. And mm -hmm. Ray is asking, what's the difference between a conduct disorder and a teen just acting? out and sort of do you see any signs of future criminal behavior by the way that a teen is acting yeah great question and you know we you know as parents having teenagers that's that's a, quite a scary thing right because you're saying oh my goodness because my teen is talking back and not obeying the rules are they going to be a criminal well not necessarily so see conduct disorder is when the you know the this sort of authority issue is persistent and continues and it's sort of over time. It's not just saying no or I don't want to do my homework. This is something that is is over the course of teachers, family, police officers, parents, most authority figures, right? When you see it sort of universal in the child, then you're leaning towards conduct issues. Now, don't forget too, there's also a less diagnosis called oppositional defiant disorder. You get into conduct disorder when you start breaking the law and damaging things and causing trouble in your environment. So there are various steps. There's oppositional defiance, which is a child that really has a problem with authority, says no a lot, and pushes back. Now you have a child that can cross the line to conduct where you're getting involved in potentially legal things, um, breaking things, criminal mischief, that kind of thing. And then, of course, if that continues as an adult, unfortunately, you get involved in what's called antisocial personality.
Yeah, I'm sure for any parent of teenagers, some days they wonder whether their children are headed down that path, but it seems as though it has to be a pretty um, unusual actions to fall under one of those diagnoses. And persistent. Uh, that's a good point as well, because a one-off isn't always a sign of a future problem. I do want to go back because I sort of skipped off the jury issue, and I, and I think your answer was important, and I think it's important that we recognize what these jurors are doing. Is it, is it helpful for jurors afterwards to have some sort of cognitive therapy to sort of find a way to put that experience aside and not let it sort of rule their lives going forward? I'll tell you what, listen, as a psychiatrist and, and psychotherapist, I. What a juror goes through, not only not only seeing visual images of a horrific or barbaric circumstance which can be traumatizing, don't forget these are people that could potentially be deciding the fate of an individual. They're seeing and experiencing the trauma of the victim's families, all of the testimonies. They're living through this. Some people can absolutely be affected and traumatized by this. And there's no question that sort of a, you know, uh, like a debriefing at least right. with a psychotherapist should be involved in some of these more you know, serious cases that have, uh, you know, homicide like this. Well, and the other thing that I've seen is a lot of times these jurors stay in touch with each other and provide the social support that way. Is that an effective means to help in situations where you sort of go through a trauma together? Yeah, so, you know, part, part of the therapeutic process is being with people that understand you and have empathy and understanding with what you've been through. And that's why trauma survivors tend to do well in groups. Um, the important thing though is to definitely have a professional involved because sometimes people that are going through the same trauma or psychological difficulty can just spin their wheels and kind of get things worse and it could snowball, right? So it's really good to have a professional involved. But being involved with people that understand you is very, very important. And that's why we see this in psychotherapy, that group therapy is very effective in trauma, in addiction, in depression, things like that. Well, Dr. Sportelli, I love having you on and giving us some insight that all we lawyers don't have. So thank you so much for your time. And we will be sure to have you on again as soon as we can to talk more, especially as we go through this Chambers case. Great. Thanks for having me, Heather. Great speaking with you. Have a great day.